What's up, guys? Welcome back to the Clinical Athlete Podcast. This is episode three. Clinical Athlete is a network of healthcare providers striving to provide science-based care to athletes. You can find your nearest clinical athlete provider on the directory at clinicalathlete.com. And let's not forget about the Clinical Athlete Forum, where we discuss and share resources on current best practice for the management of athletic rehab and performance. So before we get started with uh, today's episode, I just want to run down our upcoming Clinical Athlete events. We've got several uh, coming up. The two-day Clinical Athlete Weightlifting Certification is coming to Dallas, Texas on September 16th. Brooklyn, New York, September 23rd. Sherwood, Oregon, November 4th. And La Crosse, Wisconsin, which we just got approval by the Wisconsin Physical Therapy Association for 13 uh, continuing education credits for PT, which is pretty cool. That, yeah, that course is all about uh, improving positioning and performance for the snatch and quinn and jerk. So it's pretty cool to get some backing by the, the physical therapy field there. And then we've got several courses coming up for the uh, Scientific Principles of Sports Rehab Seminar. That course is taught by our very own Derek Miles and Michael Ray. We talk all about principles to get your athletes healthy and, and back to sport. Uh, and reduce the risk of injury. We're coming to Ottawa, Ontario on September 16th, Falls Church, Virginia, September 23rd, Richmond, Virginia, the very next day, September 24th, Harwood Heights, Illinois. That's a special two-day course with a second-day lab on September 30th and October 1st, Seattle, Washington, November 18th, and Milpitas, California on December 9th. Uh, a couple workshops coming up in Springfield, Massachusetts, and La Crescenta, California, both of which are approved by the NSCA for uh, CEU. So all the information on those courses can be found at clinicalathlete.com slash events. All right, I'm joined by my usual partners in crime, one of which is Harrisonburg, Virginia-based doctor of chiropractic, Michael Ray. What's up, Mike? Hey, Quinn. How's it going? It's going well, man. Also joined by physical therapist Derek Miles, who recently relocated to Stanford. You're a West Coaster now. What's up, Derek? What's up, Quinn? Oh, I'm doing good, man. Uh, Mike and Derek write a blog called The Logic of Rehab. And if you haven't read that, I would highly recommend it. Um, a lot of it is debunking some of the current myths and providing uh, alternative uh, methods to become closer to truth as it relates to uh, to sports rehab in, in general. And they just, they, they talk, touch about a lot of hot button topics on the logic of rehab. I definitely check those out with tons of references to back up their claims. And we're also joined today by a very special guest, Jason Ewer, who is a PT based in Fairfax, Virginia. What's up, Jason? How's it going, Quinn? It's going well, man. We're, we're happy to have you on. Super excited. <laughs> Uh, the reason that we have Jason on today is because the topic of episode three is going to be tendinopathy, and Jason has written a couple amazing blogs on the subjects of tendinopathy. Uh, they can be, find, uh, be found on Greg Knuckles' website, Stronger by Science. The title of the blogs are Squatting with Patellar Tendinopathy and Training with Biceps Tendinopathy, and they're just extremely comprehensive very well done blog with a, with a ton of references and it's just great thinking. Uh, and, and when Derek and Mike and I discussed the, the subject of tendinopathy, you know, coming up on this podcast, it was a no brainer for us to get Jason on here uh, to school us all and, and to teach us what what he knows and we can have this great discussion. Uh, and I guess we'll kind of start there. We're going to reference four papers, and I'm sure that we'll probably bring more into the mix, but. Um, we're going to kind of base the conversation around a specific four, and I'm going to read those for people to follow along with, one of which is titled, Revisiting the Continuum Model of Tendon Pathology. What is, it, what is its merit in clinical practice and research? And that's uh, Jill Cook and her team from uh, April 2016, or it was actually published in, yeah, April 2016. Uh, another article that we're going to touch on is from Sebastian Baum and, and at all, and uh, the title of that paper is Human Tendon Adaptation in Response to Mechanical Loading, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis of Exercise Intervention Studies on Healthy Adults. And that is from the, the Sports Medicine Journal from 2015. And then the third paper, uh, the famous Alfredson's study, it's titled Heavy Load Eccentric Calf Muscle Training for the Treatment of Chronic Achilles Tendinosis. And that article is from the American Journal of Sports Med from 1998. Lastly, 
from Bear and his team titled Heavy Slow Resistance Training or Heavy Slow Resistance versus Eccentric Training as Treatment for Achilles Tendinopathy, a randomized controlled trial, also from the American Journal of Sports Med, uh, originally published in 2015. Now, those first three articles I mentioned are open access on the internet, so you can get those for free. Uh, the third is not, but if someone were to send an email uh, to info at clinicalathlete.com, you may or may not be sent that article. I can't say one way or another, but there's a chance. Uh, let's just jump right in. Jason, you know, we want to start by kind of always defining our terms, right? How do you categorize, define the, the term, the diagnosis, tendinopathy? Give us a, a general breakdown of that word. All right. So everyone's probably familiar with the original terms tendinitis and tendinosis. And those kind of delineated between an inflammatory response that was acute versus something more degenerative that was lacking any inflammation. And so what Jill Cook did back in 2009 when she came out with her first paper on the continuum model was kind of take a step back from that and, and look at tendinopathy as more of an all-encompassing um, diagnosis. So it's not really trying to talk about the etiology of the disorder, more just in terms of a general description that there is a problem with the tendon. Is itis even still in favor at all? Tendonitis, is, is that something that, that holds merit or holds validity as a term to be used clinically? So it's an interesting discussion. Um, and part of that is what caused her to update her continuum model from that 2009 paper to 2016 is she modified her stance on the inflammatory component a little bit. So back in 2009, it was kind of more hard line. There is no inflammation in the disorder. Whereas in 2016, they backed off of that a little bit, talking about how it's not a classic inflammatory response. So you're not going to see the redness, the warmth, the swelling, the, uh, the focal tenderness to some extent. And you're not going to see like systemic markers of inflammation within the blood. But there are important mediators of the inflammatory process going on in the disorder. So I mean, we can get into that a little bit more later. But there is some merit to the inflammatory process still. What's the distinction between a tendinosis and tendinopathy? Um, okay, so really the continuum model was made by Joe Cook to kind of talk about how it's all one general pathology, but it's on different aspects of the continuum. So there's not so discrete between the conditions. There's more continuity between them. Does that make sense? It does. Would so tendinopathy is perhaps more of an umbrella term to uh, include clinical signs and, and tendinosis would be more of what you would see on imaging from a structural standpoint, maybe. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. So the osis is trying to denote something specific going on within the pathology, trying to talk about the degenerative changes within that tendon, whereas tendinopathy is just more general. It's not trying to make any statements about the tendon itself. Got it. If that makes sense. No, it totally does. Derek, anything to add there as far as just kind of defining our terms? I think it is a movement away from just we all like to silo out everything and place it in these really nice, nice containers. But essentially, the Jill Cook model looks at it and says, where do we start with our treatment instead of where is our actual problem? And I think the movement from osis into apathy let's us step back and realize that, that there is a multifactorial component that's just not the structure itself. It, it has more layers to it than just what's going on in the tendon itself. Anything to add, Mike? What's my question? <laughs> uh, no, I think they summed it up pretty well. Um, it's pretty concise definitions at this time. What, uh, Jason, walk us through some of the category, categorization that Cook has proposed. All right, so she kind of defined three main terms to start with. It was going to be the reactive phase, disrepair, and degeneration. Um, so I guess I can kind of just walk through. Uh, we lost Mike. There he is. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll walk through each of those and kind of talk about the differences between them. So the reactive phase of tendinopathy is going to be kind of the re acute response to tendon overload. So Immediately after some period of overload to the tendon, you're going to have a proliferative response where there's an increase in non-collagen proteins, so like proteoglycans or glycosaminoglycans, and they're going to suck water into the tendon. 
And that's going to cause a couple of things to happen, but, but typically that's a protective response. It tries to reduce the force per unit area, and that's kind of sparing of those, those tissues in the, in the tendon at that time. Um, and all of that is kind of seen at this point in time to be reversible. There's no long-term damage. There's no real collagen disorganization. So just a, a very short-lived response. If that is kind of um, drawn out or if it's intense enough, you can actually get some disruption of the collagen. And that's going to create more problems in terms of the force transmission and, and uh, cell signaling there. You're going to see increase in um, collagen synthesis as well as some ingrowth of nerve and vascular structures and this is when you're going to move more towards the disrepair stage of tendinopathy and if that progresses even further and it gets worse and there's more and more disruption of the collagen that's where you're going to be more towards the degenerate the degenerative phase is reactive is the reactive phase synonymous with clinical symptoms with pain uh for the most part yes and that's when the updated model has included a reactive on degenerative stage where you can have both kind of occurring simultaneously. And that's typically who we're going to see in clinic is people who have that acute overload response and they're going to be presenting with some local symptoms. So reactive can kind of come about one of, one of two ways or, or uh, in different stages. It could be the first time that this patient has felt uh, symptoms in their, in their knee, you know, the anterior knee, shoulder, Achilles tendon, whatever. And you, in order to differentiate, you know, aside from having some type of imaging, which may not matter, I'm sure we'll get into that, uh, we're, we're looking at the subjective history. You know, if, if, this is, if the pain itself has only been going on for two weeks, they've never had a history of this before, then maybe we can surmise that we're in the reactive, you know, non, not disrepair, not degenerative, but just that reactive phase. And if we can just clean this up as fast as possible and, and you know, get that response to die down, then maybe we can go back and everything's hunky dory, but we can also get a reactive phase in which we've, the, the patient is feeling clinical symptoms. But if you dive into their history, yeah, this has been going on and off for the last five years. And, um, you know, it's tender to the touch and it's, it's, there's a pattern there. Maybe they've even had imaging to, to show the tendinosis. Is that, is that kind of what we're looking at here is the, in regards to categorizing is the importance is just getting the history uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you nailed it there. The subjective can tell you a lot about their history and probably where they are on the continuum. Derek, before we move on, because I want to get into maybe differences as far as as far as treatment, we'll, we'll talk about is if it's you know the first time what we're seeing reactive versus reactive on degenerative. But anything to add there, Derek, as far as the the categories of tendinopathy? Um, no, I, I think Jason did a pretty thorough review out of it. Uh, one of the big things that and once again, it is a continuum, but to silo it a little bit is it's going to be predicated some by age. Um, your older people, you tend to assume it's a little bit more reactive on degenerative, whereas your younger population, it's most likely a little bit more on just the straight reactive side. Although there are some instances where they've seen some studies looking at some asymptomatic high school basketball players and volleyball players where they've seen some degenerative changes, but it still goes into we're just applying a name to it and that name allows us to kind of dictate where we start from the treatment perspective. And once we get a little bit more into the Alfredson and Bayer papers, we'll, we'll have a discussion about the name doesn't really influence as much where we start as the actual patient's objective and, and the load that they've been under. And it, it's just, it's knowing where to start the process. How does imaging play a part? Do we, do we need imaging? Do does it guide us in any way as far as seeing the structure or, or can the subjective tell us everything we need to know? I think imaging has a really good role in the research side of it because it's one of the main ways we can look at some of our structural changes itself. From the actual treatment side of it, um, it likely doesn't have much utility because we know that tendon is extremely slow in its actual turnover itself. It's been referred to as mostly dead during life. And that slow turnover is the actual collagen matrix itself, not the um, gags and proteoglycans that Jason was talking about, where we do see some influx and change of that with more of the acute loading. But the actual true tendon structure itself it is a very slow process. Mike, what are your thoughts on, on imaging? Is that guiding your practice at all? If, if you're getting... Uh, an ultrasound or, or whatever coming to you with 
the diagnosis of tendinosis, tendinopathy? Does the, the, is the imaging influencing you at all, or even as you as a practitioner, ordering imaging for a potential diagnosis of tendinopathy, does that play a part in your practice? No, I'd have to agree with what Derek said. Like, I can see utility in the research world, but for clinical practice, it doesn't have much. Like, it's not going to alter what I'm going to do with interventions based on what the research is showing currently. Um, the only time I really get it is if I have a referral and it comes with it, I'll take a look at it. But otherwise, I'm not going to order it, most likely, if I'm thinking uh, tendinopathy issues. What about you, Jason? Is, is imaging guiding your, your practice at all? or? Uh, not really. It doesn't add a lot of value. It doesn't tell me a lot that I can't get from my uh, tests anyway. Um, you know, it may tell me a little bit in terms of setting my expectations and, and helping the patient understand their expectations and the progression of the treatment. But again, I probably can get that same information from just testing and, and um, provocation tests alone too. So, Right. You mentioned something when going from reactive, so the reactive phase, to, the, to disrepair, to degenerative, you mentioned an increase in collagen production, increase in collagen synthesis. Intuitively, one would think, oh, maybe that's a good thing. We have a thicker tendon would equal a more stiff tendon, you know, so collagen synthesis would be, a, would be good. Can you touch on how increased collagen synthesis would, would be a pathology in this case? Okay. Um, well, first I want to backtrack a little bit. Um, I want to talk about how in the new updated model in the Cook paper, the reason she, she made the changes were because in the initial model, she was kind of saw it as that you could move between stages. There was a way you could kind of revert back to a normal state of the tendon. But the update has really delved into the literature talking about how we don't expect to see that change. You can have some reversibility between reactive and normal tendons and maybe some early phase disrepair. But once you reach late stage dis disrepair or degeneration, you're really not going to ever return to the normal state of the tendon. Um, so I just wanted to make sure I, I made that clear and, and um, hit on that before I talk about this. But when it comes to the collagen content of the tendon, as a protective mechanism, the tendon is going to lay down kind of type 3 collagen. And I've heard this described as kind of a patchwork to fill the area of disorganization. But the problem is type 3 collagen has really different material properties than type 1 collagen, which is kind of the strong, robust, tensile restraint of the tendons. Type 3 is more, um, a little bit more elastic, has different strain rates, and then it's laid down in a disorganized fashion. So you have a, a much thicker tendon due to that, but it has less tensile strength. So it's going to have very different mechanical behavior. Now, it's seen as kind of a positive because with all of that redundancy in the tendon, you're going to have enough viable collagen there to do whatever function it needs to do. But it can create some other problems as well. And it's not always like it's not a one to one ratio of the new collagen to the old collagen. Like it doesn't have the same material characteristics. So would you say it's the body's response is, is trying to lay down material you know, almost hastily, for lack of a better term, you know, it, it's trying to adapt to the loads being placed upon it, but it, it, it's doing so in a not, I don't want to say not as efficient, but it's just, it's trying to go fast and it's not laying the type of, of material that if it's, if the progression of load was a little bit slower, it could adapt and, and recover a little bit more favorably. Is that kind of a. Synopsis? Yeah, for the most part. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I don't know even if the load was progressed appropriately that you'd still have the, the change you want. I think that's more innate to the structure of the tendon and the adaptive capacity in general, though. Well, and that kind of ducktails into the, the next phase of this thing. You know, before we get into the treatment, why, why does tendinopathy happen? You know, what's causing these changes or these rapid changes? What's causing a tendon to go reactive or to go disrepair, to go degenerative? Why don't, why don't they just stay healthy all the time? Wouldn't that be better? Like, that's that's a can of worms. I don't know if you want to open. <laughs> silly tendon. Well, I think we need to because it, it doesn't that not uh, guide our treatment in, in some capacity. Well, it does. There's, there's probably two components to this that really need teased out if we're going to open the can of worms. And one of it is when we're taught the function of tendons, it's normally they distribute the force from the muscle to the bone. But that's not just what a tendon does. It has some elastic properties that help us with both force absorption and force transmission, like in the actual tendon itself, not just what's being generated out of the muscle. So the actual purpose of a tendon is a little bit more complex than how it's normally conveyed. 
in the same token, the big part of this is we need to tease out the word load itself because we always talk about tendon loading, but there's different types of load. So we can have small amplitude cyclic loading and things like running, or we can have very large amplitude loading and things like squatting. And it's the difference in those two parameters tends to play a large role in where we end up along the way, which I'm sure we'll start getting into. But load in and of itself is a little too ambiguous to really define what causes tendinopathic changes or what causes normal healing and adaptation. So was the trigger simply, you know, one's load, like you said, it's, it's nebulous, but one's load capacity is going to be very individualized based on the individual, the environment, the task. Uh, prior training history is prior, a big one. Yeah, prior training history. So, But would you say in general, it's, it's workload surpassing load tolerance or capacity is starting the cascade? Yes. And, and not necessarily even that, but a constant workload before the healing can transpire. So if you keep hitting it over and over and over and over again, and there isn't time for that adaptation to occur, that's where the issues arise as much as anything else. Now, once again, multifactorial prior load history, but it's not so much of a like one dose and you're done. It's you exceeded the capacity of what your prior history allowed you to do. Mike, is that consistent with what you're saying too? If somebody comes in the door with, with what you, you feel could be categorized as tendinopathy, are you, are you seeing a pattern as well? You know, if you dive into their history, they had some type of an acute uh, increase in workload or maybe even an acute dip in workload and then they try to jump back in. Is that the type of thing that you're seeing as well? Yeah, absolutely. It, it's just trying to do something that you're not prepared to do and you don't have the chronic training levels in order to adapt to it appropriately and then you're not recovering. Just so like every non-contact injury ever kind of thing, like I mean, preparedness? Yeah, I mean, as we've always, I think we've said this previously that any atraumatic musculoskeletal injury is most likely a training based injury, a failure to adapt over broad time. So, and modal domains, right? Yeah. Elite. <laughs> uh, foraging elite, Mr. Mike. Uh, <laughs> j- j- no, okay. So, we talked about different types of loading and the kind of the cause, and, and we've kind of, I guess, nailed that down as best we can with this type of. of diagnosis. So let's talk about treatment then. If low amplitude, cyclic loading, or just an increase in, in uh, workload surpassing your recoverable and adaptive abilities is the poison, well, what's the medicine? Because the medicine seems to be load as well. So let's start diving into these interventions. Jason, can you, this is another big question for you, but can you kind of start us from the beginning timeline of when we started looking at, at different types of loading strategies for tendinopathy, and then we'll, we'll progress to where we are now. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And that's a good idea to kind of walk through the thought process and how it's emerged over time. Um, so pretty much what happens for everybody in PT school is eccentric exercise pretty much comes, becomes synonymous with tendon treatment. And a large part of that is due to this research done by Alfredson. Uh, I mean, I want to hit really quick on some positives of this study before I just kind of rip into it, right? <laughs> yeah, it's always nice. It, it's, it's called a compliment sandwich, Jason. Right. There we go. So, uh, and you know, the reason he did this study, I think, is a great example of how science should work, right? He took his anecdotes, and then he, instead of just running wild with them and making a course and trying to make money on it like people do nowadays, he tried to examine it in a more systematic way. So... He set up this this study and he put the usual treatment group, which I guess at the time was more surgical management with debridement of the tendon versus an exercise protocol that he favored. And he did a good job of kind of making sure to get a lot of objective measures on the tendon capacity and he used isokinetic testing and it was it was great in that regard. And if you're looking at this study from an effectiveness standpoint, it does a great job of showing us that eccentric exercise is a viable option to treat tendinopathy. The problem comes in is the interpretation everyone else seemed to take away from this study and kind of the conclusions the author made himself later on in the paper was that eccentric exercise was the reason for that change. Now, between the groups in the study, it's looking at a group who underwent surgery and then 12 weeks of basically no exercise intervention and then 12 weeks of some standard type exercise protocol versus his group that did 12 weeks of eccentric overload training. And then they compared the markers from there. And despite the major differences in the groups, like 
after surgical intervention, there, there are known changes that occur to the tendon. There's a change in length. It changes the stretch shortening cycle of the tendon. It changes the hysteresis. It throws all that out of whack. D despite that, and despite that they didn't control for volume of the exercise, they didn't control for intensity or effort, there were still no major differences between groups in that study, with the exception of eccentric strength. But I mean, that one's kind of obvious because that's how one group was training. So you'd expect to see differences there. So despite there not being any real between group differences, the takeaway from this was that eccentric training was a stimulus which created the adaptation you need for, for treating tendinopathy. And they just really didn't set that study up to be able to tell us that. But again, the takeaway was that eccentric exercise is the way to treat this. And I just, that's not really appropriate for what the data was telling us. To be fair, when you say that there were no differences between groups, the other group had surgery. So you could look so at the, it like, you know, not, you know, conservative treatment versus a surgical treatment, no difference between groups. So why would I get surgery if I can just do some calf raises on the stairs? Why? Which is, which is a good thing. I mean, it's driving something forward. Oh, absolutely. It's adding to our body of knowledge. Again, it, it tells us about the effectiveness of that treatment, but it just doesn't tell us why. And the problem came in when they that kind of made up justification for why eccentric exercise was the right way to go about it. Right. Because you're, to your point, it's not comparing to any type of other loading. It could have been any any exercise. Exactly. As with, be, right. As with most things, wouldn't you just would you say, Jason, that it's just a narrative that was kind of flawed? Exactly. I mean, they, they took their idea and they ran with it without establishing the foundation first. Well, you get excited, man. Sometimes you just get excited. <laughs> Derek, what are your thoughts on the Alfredson study? How has it, how did it has drive your basic understanding of, of tendinopathy treatment when you first read it way back when? I think it's a, an excellent historical landmark paper because it really did start turning the ship a little bit more away from a surgical intervention. But if you also take a, a closer look at it, the normal Alfredson protocol is three sets of 15 twice a day, eccentric calf raises. You add a little bit of weight up to 20 pounds in a backpack. Um, then you have to look at the population they're studying. And these were all middle-aged recreational runners. So a little bit different of a cohort than what we see in our young, higher mileage individuals. And it really teases out why once we started getting down the road and going back to Jason's point, we had it work for this really specific cohort, but when other cohorts started trying to implement the Alfredson's protocol, it wasn't quite as efficacious. And that is where we have to start backing up and looking and saying, okay, it worked for this cohort. We need this mechanistic side to figure out what it is that's actually affecting this. And I think some of that is what's driven some of the research towards looking at the actual parameters of load with eccentric or looking at the parameters of load with heavy slow or looking at the mechanistic side of it. But if you look, it, it's, it's funny that you say, or the normal trope is clinical practice is 10 years ahead of the research. Well, when the Bayer and Kongsgaard and Magnuson paper started coming out, looking at the next phase of this was about 10 years later. So it, it actually looks like clinical practice starts getting buried by the research in about 10 year increments. And most of the time it's, it's more of a disproving than confirming, or maybe we weren't quite where we thought we were along the way. So Jason, where are we now? Or what's, where has the evolution brought us? Hey, since before we, before we jump there, I, I did want to point out like one big positive of the study. I think we failed to mention thus far is the surgical intervention group took six months to get back to pre-injury levels, whereas the eccentric only took three. So I think that's a major positive of the study that probably should we should mention, you know, it was half the time to get back to pre-injury levels for return to activity. And they, because they couldn't do anything, right? They were post-op, so they had to, they had to have this window of, of inactivity, right? And so now, and right. maybe, maybe you're decreasing fitness levels even lower. These weren't the hard-charging athletes, as, as Derek mentioned, but yeah, I think, I think that's important right. to know, too. I, with also, line. with surgery, is the worst thing we can do is rest a tendon, which we have to do post-surgery. We have no choice. So on that note, what does load, what does loading do? I, I think uh, touching on the bomb article, Jason, can you walk us through, uh, maybe this is just healthy tendons because that's actually what the, the bomb article that we referenced earlier is on is healthy individuals. When we take a step back and we just talk about loading, what exactly does that do to the tendon? What effects does loading have on the tendon? 
Well, that's going to kind of go into all the papers somewhat simultaneously if because it's going to go into the philosophy of why we're loading the tendon in the first place as well. So the goal of the loading is going to be to try to drive adaptations in the remaining viable collagen structures. Um, the, the areas of disorganization and degeneration, they're pretty much mechanically silent. So you're not able to really create any change within that tendon. But again, when we're talking about tendons, there's enough redundancy there that there's plenty of tissue to be able to kind of increase the load bearing capacity. So that's, that's the real attempt of the load. Now, the specifics behind that get a little fuzzy, and everybody has different interpretations of how we're doing this, like what exactly is the change that's driving that change in stiffness, whether it's cross links, whether it's um, tendon hypertrophy or cross-sectional area changes. It's, it's a little bit up for debate. Um, I don't know if we want to go into the weeds too much on that, but I mean, the goal is, again, to change the capacity of the remaining tissue. Capacity to, to resist load, transmit force. Exactly. Like, okay. Where are we at now? So eccentric loading with Alfredson's, eccentric loading was the type of loading. We don't really know why it had a, a change in, in pain. We don't exactly know what it did to the structure, but it did have an effect. How have we evolved now our loading strategies or, or parameters based off that? Yeah, and then so what happened was the next wave of papers, like um, Derek kind of alluded to, they, they looked at more specifically the loading protocols being used. So they're trying to tease out some more of those confounding variables. So like in, in the Bayer paper where they go over the uh, HSR versus the eccentric training, they show that the contraction mode isn't really the specific element there that's important. Uh, now, this paper isn't perfect. They only look at pain and some crude measurement of morphology, which at the end of the day isn't that important for what we're trying to decide. But uh, it at least gets us down this conversation that it may not be eccentrics. So um, I don't know if you guys want to talk about that paper more. I don't have too much to say on it. but Well, and for our two listeners, HSR is heavy, slow resistance. Derek, Sorry. what are your thoughts on where we've evolved as far as loading strategies for tendinopathy? Well, I, I think it actually points out just a problem in rehabilitation in general and that we like the innocuous three sets of 10, but that gives us our sets and reps, but we still don't have our intensity and rest. And I think a lot of the tendon papers start really elucidating that those two variables are very integral to the actual training itself. So it's one thing to do three sets of 15 calf raises eccentric off a step. It's a whole other thing to have 250 pounds on your back while you do it. Those are two entirely different exercises. So it really is the dose makes either the poison or the effectiveness out of it. And if you look at the Bayer paper, you're starting to look towards where you're seeing percent one rep max or RPE and variables like that starting to come into the actual intensity of the exercise itself. Um, with the Bayer paper, if you look, both groups, both the eccentric and heavy slow, had relatively equal results out of it. But there were one big thing that I like to point out as kind of the sell to my athletes is that heavy slow, the protocol itself, takes much less time than the eccentric protocol. So if we're talking about maximizing our training time, heavy slow may have some efficacy for actually conservation of that to go train the athlete with things they want to train on as opposed to the things they need to train on. Um, so I think that's an important variable to factor into it along the way. And yeah, and they, and they said improved patient satisfaction and compliance with heavy slow because maybe what you said, the, the overall time that you have to do the intervention is less. It's heavier. Maybe it's more fun. They feel like they're doing more, like closer to what they, they enjoy, everything like you said. What is the if we're categorizing just eccentrics, if we can conceptualize this as somebody just doing some slow calf raises downstairs with a backpack with weights on their back for, say, Achilles tendinopathy or some um, like slow four inch step downs or something like that, that could actually be heavy slow. But what's the difference between heavy slow resistance training and eccentric loading? Well, typically, your heavy slow resistance is going to have a large eccentric component to it. So you're going to have both the eccentric and then a concentric contraction. And if you're really getting into it, if you're going to run like a 3-1-3 tempo, you're even going to have an isometric contraction at some point along the way as well. So it's more getting a spectrum instead of specializing on just one small component of it. 
So is that is the tempo the big thing? You're just going. I mean, you're just going slow in both directions, and it's it's the time that you're spent under that high amount of tension that's that's the factor. Oh. There's a lot. Um, there's a lot of research on the rate of loading. So tendons adapt differently to a slow, consistent load versus a really fast load, and, and this gets into some of the specificity of training along the way. My normal statement to my athletes is: if it's heavy enough, it's going to be slow. You're not going to be able to fly through something that's really heavy. Would you say that the slow stuff is more therapeutic to a tendon, whereas the low amplitude cyclic loading is is not going to obviously you can't just say, oh it's just going to degenerate you know running is going to degenerate your tendons but that type of loading can predispose you to more of these degenerative changes there's low amplitude cyclic loading have been shown in some papers to increase angiogenesis um, increase cell proliferation so some of the things we associate with the pathology of tendon but that doesn't necessarily mean it's always going to cause it there. You just see some papers looking towards that. Um, whereas more of the heavy training seems to be things that are more protective of the tendon. And I think this is why you're starting to see increasing research showing not only improved performance in endurance athletes with strength training, but also some reduced risk of tendinopathic chain or tendinopathic symptomology in your endurance athletes who strength train. So if we've got a reactive on degenerative tendon, we're, for, from a therapeutic standpoint, we're looking at heavy, slow versus like a plyometric movement. Whereas we're obviously grading the exposure to plyos because they need to get back to that stuff. But that's not the initial intervention to say, oh, I'm going to heal up this, this tendon and then just blast you with a bunch of reactive box jumps or something like that. No, I, I don't think that would be the, the best way to start that oh, along shit, the way. I need to and, email some of my patients. <laughs> <laughs> and, and even the thing is, if you look at Cook's Continuum, and one of the big efficacies for it is once you start getting into the plyometric or, or more the, um, the high amplitude side of things as far as box jumps or wherever we're going to go with that exercise, the heavy slow in her protocol never really drops off. So that needs to be a component along the way, even as you start getting into your energy storage and energy return phase. So it, it's getting good at the shit you don't want to do. And, you know, I, I think that's kind of athletics in general. It's really fun to do the flashy stuff. Sometimes we need to do the boring things that nobody else wants to do. I mean, it's everybody uh, wants to be the flashiest player on the court, but, Tim Duncan had a pretty long career with a nickname as the big fundamental and, you know, nothing real flashy there. Shaq gave him that nickname. That's, I mean, as soon as you're bestowed a nickname by Shaq, you know you have arrived right. as an athlete. <laughs> Mike, is that, is that where you've kind of fallen to in regards to actual intervention is just, you know, heavy, slow resistance training, just simply meaning move through a, a, a movement that's similar to the one that's creating symptoms, but go slow and go as heavy as we can, uh, you know, within tolerance is, how are you treating that clinically? The two, I agree with what's been said. The two things I took away from the bone paper were pretty much we need higher magnitude loads, so higher higher intensity, um, and then just longer duration of treatment. So you saw more effectiveness with 12 weeks or greater. So knowing that, hey, this is probably going to take some time. That doesn't mean I need to treat you for 12 weeks, but maybe I guide your path of what you need to be doing for training. Um, and heavy, slow resistance seems to be the best best bet thus far. Yeah, and, and summarizing some of that bomb, Mike, you just mentioned a couple things. One thing to keep in mind with that paper is that they were on normal. It was on normal tendons, but the intensity of load seems to be more important than the type of contraction. And all three of you guys have, have mentioned that, but I, I don't think that can be stated enough. The intensity of the load seems to be at, at least as important, or maybe even more so than the type of contraction, or the other way around. The type of contraction is not quite as important as just loading them up relatively heavy and having them move through that range of motion uh, to their tolerance. And it did seem like a 12-week a intervention was slightly uh, slightly higher effect size than an eight-week intervention. Eight-week intervention still had a decent effect size, but yeah. I, I think that regardless, 8-12, it just shows you that this is a process. You know, if, if, especially with the reactive on degenerative tendon, this is not something that you're going to be intervening on and you're going to see this just crazy miraculous turnaround you know, in, in three weeks of doing uh, sideline clams for your glute med tendinopathy. I mean, you know, it's, and that's going to go on doing things that actually create enough force to make a change. But it just gives you an idea that tendinopathy and re rehabbing this thing is, is a process. 
Um, and from, from that point, Jason, I wanted to ask you, because if we have a reactive tendon, it, it's painful. We'll just, we'll just, for now, we'll say reactive is synonymous with pain. I'm not, I'm not sure if Cook has made that, dis, that uh, claim or not, but in general, that's what we're seeing somebody with a reactive tendinopathy in our office because they're in pain. And it would seem intuitive that if we're going to load them up with heavy load and they're going to move slow through that range of motion, they're probably going to recreate some of their pain. Is that okay? And to what extent are we looking at as far as increase in pain? Are there guidelines? How high should their pain increase before we say, okay, that's too much? Anything like that? That's a good question. And uh, one that I've tackled with myself a little bit. So when you look at the research, it doesn't seem that within session pain is a good marker for pretty much anything in terms of the tendon adaptation. So especially, I know Chris Littlewood has done a couple systematic reviews on this when it comes to the rotator cuff tendon. And basically, as long as there's no sign of lingering damage, so if the, the pain intensity doesn't continue for like multiple days after the fact, there's no indication um, that you're doing anything overloading that tendon chronically, it doesn't really seem to matter. There have been different cutoffs by different authors in terms of some try to keep it to no pain, some try to keep it under like an arbitrary two out of 10, some a little bit more. Some are just like, leave the ball in the patient's court. If this feels comfortable, you can do it. And it doesn't seem to really matter. So what I'll use is going to be more of the 24-hour pain response. So you give the patient some type of consistent test to do at the same time of the day. Usually it's kind of just easiest in the morning. And then they're going to kind of rate the reactivity at that point. And you're just going to monitor that over the progression of your treatment. And then so if you're noticing consistent up spikes in that level of pain, it just tells you the dosage is probably too high and you need to back it down. But within session, it doesn't do too much. Like I said, I'll typically just kind of put it in my patient's court and say, you know what, it's okay if it's a little bit of discomfort, but I don't want you to be in agony. And then let them kind of dictate from there where they go with that. Do you find that it's a interesting conversation to have because – a lot of patients in their mind, they think if there's pain, that means that they're still damaged, they're still injured. So if they're recreating pain constantly with their intervention, sometimes they'll think, oh, I'm sinking deeper into this hole. How do you spin that narrative to say, no, you know, the load is, over time, the load is going to have these changes. We know this. You just have to be okay with a little discomfort and you'll see trends over time. Is that kind of how you spin it? Yeah. And I mean, maybe Mike will go more into the uh, pain science side of this, but uh, you definitely just want to give, <laughs> you want to give <laughs> the patient. Those listening to this, Mike just smiled ear to ear at the words pain science. <laughs> um, you just want to give reassurance to the patient that pain does not correlate directly with tissue damage. It's a protective response. Is your body trying to kind of limit potential damage, but it's not a good indication of actual, like the reflection of what's going on at the tissue level. And it kind so, of goes back into that load tolerance. You can say, you know, if, if a, a four inch step down creates a six out of 10 pain now, uh, we do these interventions and in four weeks, it's now a, a four out of 10. You know, your, your load tolerance is increasing, your fear avoidance of these movements is decreasing, that type of thing. And, but I, with that test, when you say you have people do a test in the morning, does that mean some type of movement, like getting out of a chair, going downstairs, something like that? It's going to be something that directly loads the tendon that they can easily reproducibly do every day. So a lot of times for the patellar tendon, they've used a decline single leg squat. For Achilles tendinopathy, they'll use a heel raise. I mean, something that just directly loads that tendon. Do you find that you have to dial them back a little bit, like they get obsessive with testing themselves constantly throughout the day? <laughs> um, you'll definitely get those type A personality patients that get a little bit annoying, but uh, typically no. I, I don't have to kind of sit them down and have that one-to-one -to -one too often. Mike, what are your thoughts on, on creating pain in regards to your intervention with tendinopathy? Do you, do you have a conversation with the patient, and, and how do you educate them in that regard? Um, yeah, I'll do my best to keep this short so Derek doesn't get pissed off. But I think um, using pain as a marker for this is a kind of a slippery slope. It's going to be pretty difficult to do because we do have the fair majority of research says there can be central centralization with this issue. Um, so I usually prime them from the get go and just say, hey, this is probably going to be a bit painful throughout this process. I, I'm like Jason. My measure of success with treatment is basically 
if this lingers into the next day, we probably push this a little bit too hard. And I even give them that caveat for, say, when they go to practice, because I still want them to be able to do what they're capable of doing during training with practice. And I'll say, you know, monitor what you do in practice. And if the next day you notice some pain with it, then you probably did too much. The dosage was too great at that session. But I give them the information from the get go. So we set that expectation that, hey, this is going to be a bit painful throughout the process, but it's necessary. And once you do that, then it kind of goes a little bit more smoothly in how, rehab. How do you address the question that I get a lot is, if my tendon hurts now and I'm just making it hurt with the intervention, how is that different than what I do on a day-to-day -day basis? If I feel pain going up and down the stairs with my tendon, why is that different than this slow squat that I'm doing for an intervention? Yeah, it, I mean, in essence, it just comes back to dosage. And with the loading, we know that we're trying to teach the tendon to retransmit force and adapt to forces being put through it. So that's kind of the, the narrative I give them is it's just a different type of load that we're applying to it. And the difference being what we talked about, like amplitude, uh, right. duration. Low amplitude versus hot. Yeah, exactly. Derek, thoughts on, on your you know, pain, reproducing pain with intervention and how you spin that? How do you, how you frame that for patients? Well, I think there's one good point to mention that we've kind of skipped over is we immediately, all four of us, went to eccentric and heavy slow and out of Cook's camp and Ebony Rio's research, there is some pain mitigation analgesia with isometrics. I was going to go there. I was going to go yeah. there. I swear well, I was, right? Go ahead. I'll man. take us there. It's fine. Okay. And, and, and I'll be honest, I often skip that step because I think with some of the education, it's it allows you to do so. But in the same token, if you get someone who is much more symptomatic, the actual isometric protocols are, aren't are very good ways of trying to mitigate that. And there you're getting some of the analgesic effect by having prolonged, once again, high load isometrics. So, you know, you want an actual, if you look at it, they were kicking in and holding out isometrics for uh, anterior knee pain for 45 seconds for sets. And, and this was essentially their treatment to get an analgesic effect to allow athletes to play through. Now, this gets into some of the in-season, off-season, when's your race conversation and where we're getting into it. But I, I think there's another good point to circle back to that we missed a little bit earlier that Mike made an excellent point in terms of treatment duration. And so this, it, we all want to feel better tomorrow, but we almost have to look at the tendon adaptation like we do our actual training. And I don't know about you guys, but if I had a 10% change in one mesocycle on any of my big three lifts, I'd be, yeah. I'd be selling my training program over and over all over the country or over the world. So I'd probably be almost a Quinn's level of international speaker at this point. Not quite that amazing, but it's, yeah. it's getting there. Oh, so, yeah. Wait, hold on. That remind, real quick. That reminds me, Jason, you threw a jab out there about uh, systems and courses. Was that, was that a shot at us? No, no, like, not oh, at okay, all. Okay. So, <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was offended by it, actually. So. But it really goes back to these are small changes in, in really educating that it is part of the process. Whenever I have my tenopathic patients, I almost always say this will start feeling better relatively quick. And sometimes we may even make it feel good. And you're going to take it for a test drive and we're going to, you're going to go out and run two miles and all of a sudden your symptoms are going to return. This isn't the end of the world. We now know what X is. We know what our capacity is. So now we know you can run two miles without issue. We'll go back. I'll, I'll kind of snicker that you went above your capacity. We'll calm it back down, get back to where we need to be. And if we go from two miles to three miles, it may not seem much if you're a marathoner, but that's a big increase in capacity. So it's, it's framing it as those small wins in tissue capacity from what you're able to do and then making it be seen as part of a process instead of this inflection point. So you've got their, their loading strategy to try to make some type of change to the, to the tendon or even just desensitize the tendon. And then you've got their activity of choice that you're grading the exposure towards. The difference in this case is that you're, you're mitigating the load with that activity, but you've, you're adding in this loading strategy here that's supposed to have these uh, beneficial changes. So you're kind of, you're getting the, you know, both. Taking it from, so it's always a, a dichotomy of what we say and what we do that's really going to drive. And it just falls in that spectrum of, is it 50-50? Is it 80-20? And I guarantee you, Mike can speak much more eloquently to the actual, some of the effects of especially what we say comes into it. 
But setting expectations, and, and Mike, I'll tee this one up for you, uh, I think is one of the real driving forces behind the treatment of tendinopathy. Yeah, yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, it, it really does, like how Derek's describing it, is basically trial and error. Like, it, we have a lot of good information coming out on how to treat tendinopathies as far as with loading strategies and dosage of movement, but it comes down to individualistic abilities to adapt and recover, and it's, it's just a bit of a, a game at first. It's like, like Derek said, it's like, well, you fucked up, you did a little bit too much, and now we need to back that off, and then it, it doesn't go perfectly every time and it is very much a process and that's why like Derek's saying you said expectations early like we're not going to get this right immediately but most likely because we're doing something you're going to start feeling better pretty quickly that doesn't mean you're ready to go you know 100 percent rts immediately the very next day yeah real quick back to the isometrics and, and this is for all you guys but Derek, you had mentioned the isos first do the isometric exercises, the high load, long duration holds, provide anything other than analgesic? Can they create the same structural change that other types of loading strategies can? So I've never seen a paper dictating that. Jason, I don't know if you have or not. Um, yeah. There's, it depends on where you're starting, I would argue. If you have someone who's a degenerative tendinopathy who's basically been really inactive and decided they wanna start a walking program, I certainly see how some isometrics could have some structural change. If it's you know an elite level pick your sport, then I, I have a feeling that dosage would be a little bit too small to really elicit a big change in tendon structure. Jason? Uh, yeah, so I mean, outside of the analgesic effects, which has come under fire recently that it may not be that important to do isometrics for those, but outside of that, there seems to be some sort of cortical change that happens doing that kind of warm up. Okay. Yeah, but so there's going to be some reduction in cortical inhibition. So kind of subconsciously, the body's trying to protect itself, and it's not going to allow you to express force very well in that condition. And what it's shown is that there is a significant increase in your ability to recruit those muscles after the fact of doing those isometrics. So even if you're not using it to kind of calm the, the situation down, it still may have benefit before your training session. Would you call it a, a primer, basically, before you start loading? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Potentiator. I mean, come on, help me out with this narrative here, Jason. Give it me needs to be at least lingo. four syllables, whatever we're going to call it. Well, it's, I mean, that makes, it makes a lot of sense. You use it, so you get the end, like you make a muscle burn. We can spin that a lot of different ways. Does it make you, it's like when, if I bang my knee on the edge of a desk and I just rub it really hard. I'm like, ah, shit, and I try to create another sensory response. Well, in this case, my tendon, I'm always like, you know, keyed in on my tendon pain, but now I get my muscle to burn like hell, and it takes my mind off the tendon pain or does it, you know, is it some type of other inhibitory thing where I can fire, I'm now firing that muscle and all of a sudden that, that nervous system is, ch is charged or primed as Mike said to that area. Yeah. So I don't know if it's been like hammered out that well in terms of the me mechanisms of what's creating that change. But I, I, if I had to guess, I would say it's more than just a distraction. It's more than just cognitive um, change there. It's, it's going to be something specific to that neural pathway. Yeah. Good. That I, sounds I, better. Yes. <laughs> Improved neural pathway functioning. Yeah. Oh, Lord. Can you make an acronym uh, out of that, Mike? I was just trying, dude, and that I've been up way too long. This is not it's, possible. As soon as you make an acronym, it increases the efficacy <laughs> of any treatment 30%. We're going to add that to Sponsor. We're going to talk about that next There you time. go. We got an acronym there. <laughs> the only time I really find myself using isometrics, and I think Derek kind of alluded to this earlier, is if it's a high um, catastrophizer or high fear avoidance, then I and they think they can't do a lot of things or they're very scared to load it, then I'll be like, okay, let's spend a session or two of just getting you used to loading this and how to do it. And isometrics seem to work really well because it, it's kind of a low threat positioning usually. What about in season too? If they've got multiple games a season, baseball, basketball, soccer, that type of thing, do you find benefit there versus heavy, slow or eccentric where those, the latter could recreate pain and sensitize them going in? To their games. Possibly, but I still think it becomes a question or a discussion between you, the athlete, and the coaching staff of there's probably some things that you shouldn't be doing during season if it's at all possible. And I get that if you're a professional athlete and you're getting paid to play, that's it's a it's a difficult discussion to have for sure. Or even a club, even a kid who's forced to play, you know, his parents are going to take him to these two games regardless. Jason, what's the research on in season as far as loading yeah. strategies? Yeah, I wanted to chime in on that real quick. So they, they've looked at kind of the different response people have during in-season training. And, and I know when they compare kind of isometric to eccentric or heavy eccentric training, that 
the latter, the heavy eccentrics can kind of flare people up a little bit. So it's definitely something you have to be very careful of in season when they're already dosing that tendon pretty high with their sport demands. Adding on top of that is not always going to be beneficial. So maybe some strategies just to kind of calm it down and then talk to them about kind of regulating their volume um, in other ways outside of playing. That can go a long way. But just dosing the same way you would as if they were in off season is not going to be too helpful. So I'll typically try to use something kind of lower intensity that doesn't take them through that big amplitude if I can avoid it in season. Would you say that if the lower... Well, actually, I shouldn't say that. I didn't mean lower intensity because that's not what I want to change. It's going to be lower volume. Would you up the frequency though? Because like what, let's say isometrics, ultimately, I would still categorize that as a low load exercise compared to a heavy slow it, you know, an 80, 80% max volitional contraction, I'm not sure if you're getting the same loading if you're doing heavy slow for six to eight reps. So if you're doing isometrics, would you increase the frequency per week? Because they can probably do more isometrics than they could heavy slow or heavy eccentrics. I mean, that's, that's tough to say um, because in the bone paper, they don't even distinguish adaptations differing between isometrics, eccentrics, and the standard isotonic contraction. So I can't even speak to if it would make a difference. But that now, was also on healthy subjects, correct? So the, there's there's yeah. no tendinopathic changes going on in those participants. So there's really no, I guess my biggest question is if we're just doing isometrics, which I get, we don't want to overload the tendon during the on season, we're probably not making a lot of changes to the tendon's ability to transmit force or adapt to forces being applied to it. Yeah, so it's a shift in goals, right? So if you're in season, I mean, I don't know if you're going to be able to get the sufficient intensity, volume, and frequency that you need to drive those adaptations anyway. Good so point. it's going to be, you know, just kind of pick your poison in that regard. Yeah. So with this, it really gets into the, the narrow framing of volume, intensity, and rest. And that we can look at the Bayer paper or some of the Kongs Garden. It has really clear protocols on, you know, you start out with 15 rep max over week one, and then you like regress down to four by six at a higher intensity over 12 weeks. Now that's good, great and grand in someone who's not in season. So we have our volume intensity and rest of what we want to dose out during our therapy or rehab session. And then we have to be cognizant of the overall volume intensity and rest that athlete is getting if they're in season as well. So it's being able to step back and saying, well, this athlete's sleeping four hours a night right now because they're close to tournament time and finals are coming up. So what I need to do most is get them through the rest of the season to where I can get through this off season and mitigate their symptoms. But yeah. this also comes back to a big advocacy with our athletes, especially our younger athletes in taking some form of an off season along the way, because that's where those adaptations really come in. And we can be much more clean in emphasizing the actual training side instead of the competition side of it as well. So we, still don't, we still don't know anything basically is what you're saying. <laughs> I, I, we have some really good research with which to guide us. It, it's just being able to step back and realize that in a lot of instances, especially when it's treating athletes, it's not just us in rehab. And, and it's never going to be just us in rehab. Yeah. It's their coach, their parents, them, their peers. And we can have the greatest plan in the world laid out. But if there's multifactorial issues outside of rehab, it may not yield the results we're looking for. And, and I think instead of saying we don't know that much, it's much better to say we do know a decent amount. We just have to concede that there's a lot going on outside of our control. Well, and the yeah. question, the common question with tendinopathy is what is the dosage? What's the, you know, what's the perfect dosage for this? You know, what's the program? Write me a program for tendinopathy. And I, that's, I think that's what you're getting at. I don't know if we'll ever get there because of all these confounding factors, because of the different presentation types and the, and the psychosocial you know, aspect of, of pain it just makes these things incredibly complex. But if we have these concepts in place, then we can just start somewhere. I think, I mean, would you guys agree that a lot of, a lot of the pr programs that we prescribe for tendinopathy and the doses are just trial and error? You know, let's start yeah. somewhere yeah. and see how you respond and then we can adjust from there. Derek, you're looking at, to the heavens here. I don't think it's trial and error because I think we do have some good foundations with which to start off of. Because if it was just trial and error, it's throwing spaghetti at the, against the wall and seeing what sticks. And if you look at the Bayer Kongs Guard papers, we do have some good frames with which to start. And even going back to what Jason was saying earlier, like we have parameters of 
we may not want to push beyond a certain point of pain or in in its but that's still not just, go ahead but it's, but it's not trial and error when you at least have somewhere you're aiming well yeah i think start, it's frame, it's, not, it's a framework to operate from it definitely yeah. guides the path but it's very individualistic of who can tolerate what like and that's where it becomes trial and error in my mind is like yes these are our starting points based on what the research is showing us but then you as an individual and all the things that are confounding variables that we need to consider let's see where we can go from here like, trial and error is a cop out that lets that bullshit of my clinical experience has told me this and and you can't say that because there are a lot of factors that should dictate or predicate what you're doing with your athletes just sometimes it's a concession that there's a lot of factors that are outside of your control as a clinician like in your ideal world, and, and this gets into the kind of the translation between research and clinical practice that I'm sure someone is smiling ear to ear that they're like, oh, but the real world isn't clinical research. Well, bullshit. The research still gives us a lot of pathways with which to look at. And I don't think Quinn and I are disagreeing with that. I, think I, don't, think, I don't think so at all either. I, I think it's an easy misinterpretation for a listener to say, well, I can just trial and error this and, and rely off my clinical experience. I think yeah. there's going to be an issue with all of this in and of itself that the marker that we've all mentioned is pain tolerance, and that's going to automatically create some issues for us. You know, like you use the two mile example for a marathon runner and the guidance is, is what pain can you tolerate into the next day? That's a big issue because there's going to be a lot of fucking things that are influencing someone's pain at the current situation, as well as their tolerance and their levels and willingness to go out and run that two miles and deal with certain amounts of pain. Like that's a very difficult topic that I'm not sure like this particular podcast is prepared to handle or get into right now. And that's why I say it's trial and error. Maybe you could have tolerated, maybe that tendon can tolerate that two miles, but that day you couldn't tolerate that two miles pain wise. And, and I fully think like, I, I know that's where you and Quinn are going with this. I just want to be explicit to the listener on this. Yeah. All, all, and I said listener in singular for that one person that's doing it. <laughs> A poor, poor soul. <laughs> yes. Yeah, to your point, Derek, we have a, the, the research has given us a starting point. It's given us concepts and guidelines and, and principles. And, and we have to, we'll probably, probably have to adjust over the course of those eight to 12 weeks, 16, you know, however long that it's not going to just be this most likely this, this just perfect uh, progression. And that's, you know, whether trial or an error is how you want to describe that or just, you know, um, educated adjusting or whatever. Uh, certainly, yeah, to the listener, just know that it's an inconsistent process and, and you'll get it. We're, we're well, behind you. And, and use research. For fuck's sake, use research. <laughs> well, you look at it like if we're going to get into the guiding side of it, like the weather analogy is always good. Like everybody hates the weatherman, but if you look at it, they're really statistically 80% of the people that are listening to this are going to experience rain today. That's a much harder thing for us to comprehend. And if you look at weather prediction, once you're five days out, they suck because there's just too many variables in it. And I think if you're looking for this cookbook that's like weeks one through 10, that's where it's never gonna work. But it's realizing as you get more information, as you progress through it, it's not trial and error, it's using that additional information to better inform your next step. I like it. Jason, anything to add to that piece? That was, no, that was, uh, that was well done. Well, I wanna switch gears here and talk about some of the common uh, conceptions or maybe misconceptions, myths about tendinopathy, and we may kind of run down those one by one. Uh, uh, I think there's probably a couple more things we can talk about in terms of dosing and prescribing the exercise that we didn't touch on. Do it, man. Yeah, so I mean, I wanted to kind of loop back to um, something we didn't talk about in the BOEM article, which was the only contraction type that tended to matter was going to be the plyometric contractions. And I, I know we talked a little bit about the cyclical loading earlier when it came to tendinopathy, but we didn't kind of dive into why that may be. Um, when it comes to the plyometric loading and why that's usually such a problem for athletes is going to be that not only are the absolute stresses high in those events, but the strain rate is really high. And that's because of the viscoelastic characteristics of the tendon. It changes the way that tendon interacts with the muscle and is going to change the ultimate stress experienced by that tendon. So those plyometric contractions are, are a really tough sell to try to get and, and rehab to drive adaptation. And especially, you know, it may also be some element of time under tension in there as well that we talked about with the HSR. But it's, it's something to consider when you're trying to get an athlete back is to really be very careful and deliberate with the dosage of those plyometric contractions. 
because you don't really see any morphological adaptation of the tendon when you're using those, and it is very provocative. So you have to go very slow with those. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that was that was clear. Um, and then, we have to go slow when we want to go fast. That's just <laughs> ridiculous. Um, and then the the next thing is going to be the frequency of dosage, which is something that seems to be really important but doesn't get a whole lot of I don't know press about it. So one of the confounding variables between HSR and eccentric training is how often you're dosing and and kind of the frequency of stimulus you're providing. With Alfredson, it's twice a day, every day, you know, seven days a week for however long. With HSR, it's like three to four days a week. And why that may matter is going to be due to changes in the protein synthesis and degradation rates. When Magnuson came out with the paper, I forget, maybe 2015 or so, he showed how our loading actually changes the adaptive response of the tendon cells themselves. So the, the tendon cells are responsible for maintaining homeostasis within the tendon. And so when they get stimulated through load, they're going to either promote or kind of negate um, protein synthesis. So in the first 24 to 36 hours after you load a tendon, the net balance is actually negative. So you're probably at risk for losing some collagen in that time frame. Now, from 36 hours to like 72 hours, it's a net positive. So it's much more beneficial in that area to be able to gain some um, morphological adaptations. So if you're constantly stimulating the tendon within 24 hours, like every day using the eccentric protocol, that's going to be a problem because you're never going to be in that net positive balance. So you're never giving yourself a chance to have those adaptations. It gets a little murky because the, the connection between structure, function, and pain isn't that well outlined, especially when you're looking at the eccentric literature, but there's a little bit to support it in the HSR literature. And ultimately, if we can drive those changes without any negative consequences, it's still something to consider. So if we can get those changes in the tendon cross-sectional area or the stiffness or other, other like uh, cross links or anything like that, why not strive for that as well? I like it. The stiffness, what is the, the main driver as far as the attribute of the tendon that we're trying to improve upon other than de desensitizing pain? Is, is stiffness king? Like what are we looking at there? Like what are we trying to adapt? Well, as far as I know, stiffness is what we seem to have the biggest effect on early on, at least in eight to 12 weeks. Now, outside of that time frame, we may have more benefits in terms of the cross-sectional area, but that it, it's a hard job to get longitudinal studies that go on that long. So we don't have a ton of data in that regard yet, but that's mostly just kind of theory and conjecture right now that longer duration may lead to more changes there. Jason, how are they measuring, uh, just for the audience's purposes, how are they measuring stiffness in the, these research articles? Um, so what they'll usually do, are you asking like, how they'll visualize and how they'll they'll kind of document it or yeah how are they tracking different? stiffness alterations in the tendon so what i've seen is what they'll typically do is they'll put the person under some type of isometric load and then visualize the tendon using some sort of ultrasound and then measure the um the change in length given the amount of force okay is that young's modulus that yeah i think i think that's usually the marker yeah so Young's modulus is, is the stiffness taking the cross-sectional area into account. But we may not so, even be making cross-sectional area changes for the first 12 weeks. It, yeah. it doesn't look like it, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's much more likely a lot of the changes we see are like what Jason was referring to, it, some of the non-collagenous components of it, more your proteoglycans and, and things that do increase some of that. And, if you think about it, if you're drawing more water into a tendon, it's going to be stiffer. Like the entire field of hydraulics is the, related to the non-compressibility of water. So it, it, it makes logical sense that if you start drawing more fluid into the tendon itself, it's going to be stiffer. And, and there could be, and I completely can't support what I'm about to say, but if you do make that tendon stiffer through the influx of water, it, it could be taking some of the pressure off the actual extracellular matrix collagen itself in order to allow it to heal. But back to Jason's point a minute ago, it, with the net negative after training, 
I mean, we basically accept in the entire string training world that we have a net negative effect as soon as we're done, and it's that adaptation that comes with the rest. So this seems to fall in line with what we generally accept to be the standard for the strength adaptation response. Would it be, would it be a fair assumption or, or hypothesis that maybe the eccentric loading is, I mean, they got better doing it every day, twice a day for seven days a week. Maybe it's just not, not even enough load to create a negative benefit. So there's probably some sort of like threshold effect going on here, and there may be more reasons why that is beneficial than collagen synthesis, right? As we talked about, there in, in the literature pertaining to eccentric exercise, you don't even really see structural changes in that regard. So that's probably not the benefit of those interventions. It's probably due to something else. Why is a stiff tendon a good tendon? What does that mean for performance? Does that mean I'm going to have a 40-inch vert if my tendon is not stiffer? It's not good and bad. It's where on the spectrum it is. If you get something super stiff, it's more prone to break. Yeah. So it, you want something that's able to achieve some type of elastic coil on it. But if you get, you know, if you're too loose or whatever word we want to use for it, um, too not stiff, then chances are you're going to get some slack taken out of that extracellular matrix and may cause some micro tears, some physiologic changes. Where if we're on the other end of the spectrum and you're super stiff, then that force still has to go somewhere. So then you may be exposing the tendon to more of a gross problem instead of But it doesn't, small. it doesn't sound like we want to go from stiff to looser. It, sound, it well, sounds it, like these interventions are, cre are increasing stiffness. Man, so what, so what some, does, these adjectives are going to take yeah. us down I a want path you to that say do not want to go down. If you're too tight, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, listen, would it, would it, well, would it even be measurable from a performance perspective, having a, a tendon that's changed in regards to stiffness over the course of eight to 12 weeks? How, you know, how would you measure that from a performance standpoint? If you, if can you? So I, I'll, I'll take this first, I guess. It's going to be why we want to create a stiffness adaptation. I think it's mostly due to the change in the collagen structure. As we talked about earlier, you're going to have more type three rather than type one, and that's inherently less stiff. So you're trying to just build up that that kind of normal tendon capacity. Um, and usually that's going to be trying to create a little bit more stiffness there. And then that can affect athletic endeavors because it's going to interact with the um, kind of muscular tendons unit in general. And it's going to allow for a little bit change in your optimal force expression there, if that makes sense. Definitely. What else you guys got in regards to tendon loading, intervention, uh, workload, monitoring, anything in that regard before we move on to busting some myths? Got anything else, Jason? Uh, no, I just wanted to backtrack and make sure I kind of hit on that because it's a big deal that most clinicians out there, they give their HEP for the patient to do every single day. And if we're trying to follow the best evidence, that's really not indicated, right? You want to give some sort of restitution period. So how often do you normally advocate for your patients to do it? I'll tell them every other day, and then if they don't do that, which they probably won't, they'll probably get it in three times a week, and I'm okay with that. Yeah, I normally operate under the every other day assumption, hoping if I go 50%, I now got twice a week. There you go. But could you do something? Could you fill in the gaps with some low-level, low-load isometric every day to just have them do something, to just feel that muscle burn a little bit every day that's not probably not creating a, a net negative? I mean, it may, it may be beneficial from a psychological standpoint, you know, uncoupling the contraction of that muscle from pain and then just exposure. Um, I don't know, but I don't typically like go out of my way to tell them to do that, but I give them that as a strategy if it's bothering them. So they could use that every day. Mike, what do you, anything else you got in regards to loading intervention, workload monitoring? No, I think we've covered everything. Um, the only thing I was going to say earlier is, did we say anything about treat the donut, not the whole type with Jill Cook work? No. I feel like we probably left that out. <laughs> so the treat the donut, not the whole gets into the structuralist side of it and what Jason was alluding to earlier about parts of tendon becoming mechanically silent. And what the thought process is now is that you're not actually targeting the degenerative tissue itself, you're, you're trying to create more of a structural change around the tendon and you're never going to change once something has become degenerative. Now, there is some evidence that shows some loose interpretation to where I don't think that is entirely settled out now, but 
then we start getting into some other papers and some methodological qualities there that I don't think we're prepared to go into today. But the thought process, if we're going to skip the rock across the water, is the actual degenerative tendon doesn't experience much of a change. So you're not actually going after the whole of the donut, but what you're trying to strengthen up is everything around it. So you're actually trying to strengthen up the actual donut itself while foregoing the structural change in the middle that isn't probably going to respond to whatever your protocol is. So there was a, go ahead, Quinn. No, you, you, what you were going to say, it sounds like it's going to be a lot more important and smarter than what I'm going to say. <laughs> that is such shit. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm blanking on the name of the study, and I bet Derek's going to remember this, but there was a really cool study done on this with like where people were close proximity to nuclear bomb sites, and they, they tracked tendon turnover, and basically they didn't see much turnover past a particular age, which I think was, what was it, like 18. 14 or something, 18, yeah. So in that study, they, they looked at the uh, radioisotope form of carbon from all the nuclear test explosions back in the 50s and saw that there wasn't much change in the tendon structure beyond the adolescent population. So it, it looks like, and this gets back into the mostly dead during life conversation, once that extracellular matrix is there from the collagen standpoint, there's not a whole lot of turnover unless there is some acute event like a laceration that requires a surgical repair, then obviously you have to lay down some more collagen out of that. But for our tendinopathic conversation, there's not a lot of change throughout your lifespan. So there's just no hope for that degenerative portion of the tendon. It's just dead, silent, black death. That's well, certainly not buried yet, but the research right now seems to be stating that you don't get a whole lot of turnover out of that degenerative portion itself. And you could be in the degenerative phase of tendinopathic changes and have zero symptoms, so it doesn't necessarily mean it's an issue that we should even concern ourselves with. Maybe it predisposes you to becoming reactive. It does. Uh, there are papers looking at that, and if you have some degenerative changes in the asymptomatic population, uh, this is some of the basketball and volleyball studies where they've looked preseason and those athletes that did have some degenerative changes before the season started were at a higher likelihood of becoming symptomatic once the season did start. And th these are, this is a younger population, right? Yes. So if we're, yes. if we're looking towards 40s or higher with degenerative tendinopathic changes, then it's less likely that that's going to make a difference because they're pretty much stuck in that degenerative phase at that point, right? Well, if we're going to say it doesn't turn over, as soon as you go degenerative, if you try and increase your load, you automatically go into reactive on degenerative. So okay. it, it's if you're over 40 and you have any degenerative changes and you go try and do something and become symptomatic, well, chances are there was a degenerative portion in there before. So it's right. not necessarily that it was the degenerative portion was there. It just is what it is. If you take someone 40 with a perfect tendon and you start increasing their load capacity well beyond what they're capable of. Chances are they may become reactive as well because they're above what their tendon capacity is. So exactly. it's, it's not really a, yes, you had degenerative, you're more predisposed. Now, and like once again, the, the research in the younger population certainly seems to state that. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. You guys want to bust some myths? Let's do it, man. Okay. Uh, Jason, rapid fire. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, ready. So I get people to come into the door a lot and they have tendon pain and they perceive that as tightness, the word tight, you know, everything's tight. Oh, it feels tight in front of my knee. Right. And so intuitively, or maybe this has been a intervention that's been prescribed to them by another clinician or coach or whatever is to stretch the tendon, static stretching of the tendon. It feels tight. So I want to loosen it and make it and stretch it. What do you say to that in regards to the mechanisms of that intervention? Is there any efficacy there at all for static stretching to treat tendinopathy? Yeah, so stretching has really fallen out of favor recently, and that's a lot to do with the role of compression in tendinopathy. Um, so what's going to happen is it's been shown that compression on its own really isn't that big of a deal to tendons, but when you combine compression with tensile loading, it's a recipe for a little bit of disaster where it's going to be really reactive to that. So just constantly putting the, the tendon in a position where you're going to be adding compressive load when you're stretching is just not really anything that's going to be beneficial. It's not going to be driving the adaptations we want, and, and at best it's just going to like be a temporary time waster. And at worst, it's going to just provoke the tendon and limit how much you can actually do in terms of loading. By compressive load, do you mean the tendon tissue approximating to bony 
structure. How do you differentiate between tensile loading and compressive loading? So, yeah, I mean, typically that's going to be what we talk about when it comes to compressive loading. It's going to be a, an abutment next to some bony landmark. Um, when it's tensile loading, it's kind of the normal way tenons deal with stress. It's that, you know, um, longitudinal stress when you're contracting a muscle. Derek, so, do you have people stretch for their tenons? No, no not at all. And, and from the research itself, um, Jan Peters has a systematic review for preventive interventions for tendinopathy. And from the conclusions, no evidence was found for a positive effect of stretching exercises. So it's stop stretching. Mic drop. And yeah. two, if, if stiff, if tendon stiffness is seems to be something that we're going after as far as an intervention, it wouldn't make much sense that static stretching would improve upon that. Mike, any thoughts on on static stretching for tendonopathy? I mean, outside of just for tendonopathy based issues, just stop fucking static stretching. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there actually is a systematic review that looks at prevention or stretching for prevention of all injuries that comes to the same conclusion that static stretching doesn't really have any efficacy and may actually predispose towards some injuries if you do it so uh, you know what's the good of giving you the extra range of motion if you can't fire the muscle in that range of motion so stop stretching was that the Wepler article Derek um, off the top of my head I don't remember the author it was it okay I'll, have to, I'll, I'll, I will, uh, I'll look it up and uh, link it in no, uh, Wepler's the one that talks about stretching just providing a sensory change. Uh, that's right. It's yep. not Modif actually tissue change. That's right. Yeah, modified sensation. You're right. Yeah. Okay, along those lines, so static stretching doesn't impart the load that we've talked about. It's just it's not going to create the adaptation or the, the stressor to elicit the adaptation that we're looking for. It just simply doesn't do that. What about things like instrument-assisted soft tissue, uh, you know, massage to the area, or just manual cross friction massage. What what are the benefits there, if any, for tendon? Mike, this is all Mike. I mean, there are benefits. There are none other than it may alter sensory perception of the tissue. But going back to compressive forces on a tendon, why would you want to take a metal instrument and press it over that tendon? Like we already know, that's not a good thing to be doing. So I'm. Um, Outside of that, I think the negatives outweigh the positives with it. Even you can alter sensory input a lot of different ways. So why have someone do a passive modality other than you can charge for it and make some money off of it when we could do other things like isometrics, change your perception, and then start loading you? I've heard one claim for those interventions to be, well, I'm increasing blood flow. Derek, I want you to touch on this because I've heard you speak on it before. Is increasing blood flow to an area, specifically a tendon, good? Is that a benefit? So this is that common trope, and, and it tends to be like whatever's advantageous to whatever narrative is being driven. We're increasing blood flow. Well, movement increases blood flow. Specific to a tendon, if we look at the actual tendon structure itself, it, it's highly avascular. So why would I want to increase blood flow to something that's highly avascular in the first place, especially when one of our hallmark signs of tendinopathy is increased angiogenesis? So it, it doesn't make any sense along the way. And it goes back to that, especially with IA stem and, and some of the umbrella bullshit things that are perpetuated throughout the rehab profession. It, it all is, you know, sometimes it's good to increase inflammation when we do something. Sometimes it's good to decrease inflammation. And if you can't substantiate why you're driving that, then you're just spitting bullshit. And especially the blood flow side of it, it's such a lazy way of trying to explain things because if you get someone moving, you're going to increase the local blood flow to it. So why would I have them do a passive modality where I'm going to do the same thing that I could have them do where they're being the active participant instead of me being the active participant doing something to them? Jason, thoughts on on those interventions? Yeah, I mean, I want to take it all the way back to biological plausibility and what we're even trying to gain from that type of intervention. Like, so when you look at healthy tendons, the difference between positional tendons that constantly undergo compressive stress versus the more kind of elastic energy storage tendons that are going to do more of the cyclical loading, the changes that occur in the positional tendons that have compression stresses, they have a lot more kind of uh, fibrocartilage type tendencies. And they're going to have a difference in collagen makeup, and they're going to have more proteoglycans in that area to help kind of shield it from that stress, right? So say it's a big leap here, but say we're able to impart enough stress using those tools to drive changes in the tendon. It's not even going to be the changes we want to have for that tendon. 
like it's not going to be representative of the the um, demands that that tendon is going to experience once it goes back to its normal level of load. So even if we're able to stimulate adaptations, which is a big if because the load we're able to impart on that tendon is probably nowhere near the physiological level. But even if we do gain that, it's not going to help us in any way functionally. And I think it's important to say that these these claims that we are discussing here, none of them have actually been even substantiated. I'm not sure, have, have they even shown that these things can increase blood flow? Even if we wanted to increase blood flow, let's just throw that on the table. Do they even do that? Do they, can, not you to know, my knowledge, no. I mean, so it, it just seems like things that, like as Derek mentioned, that are kind of um, manufactured to for for their narrative on that day and whatever seems to to sound like it would be a good thing oh it does this thing um and there just doesn't seem to be a whole lot of evidence to substantiate that because and we promised mike that we would talk about these interventions as well now let's go into prp stem cell injections uh perhaps some prolotherapy i'm not i'm not sure if there's if we have the the evidence on that versus the the, fir the first two but mike do you want to touch on PRP and stem cell therapy for the treatment of tendinopathy? Yeah, I meant to pull that study up. Derek might have it. You can pull it up. But there was a recent review done on stem cell therapy, and basically the conclusion was there's no efficacy for the treatment of it utilizing stem cell therapy. Do you have? Do you remember the name of yeah, that study? It's, it's by POS et al. It's no evidence for the use of stem cell therapy for tendon disorders, a systematic review. Yeah, and I don't, I don't remember how many studies were in that review. It, I don't think there's a lot of research on stem cell therapy, but overall... So it, it was four published and three unpublished pending trials for a total of 79 patients, but no evidence for it whatsoever. Yeah, yeah. So were they, um, that kind of takes care of that pretty quickly. Were, they, uh, were there blind controls there? So the... I'm pretty positive these were all the four studies. Now, granted... It was four studies on different joints, so we, we can't take this as some overall, as much as I think everyone in this group's bias is that stem cell doesn't hold any efficacy, and there are papers that fully support that. With four published trials and the systematic review and three unpublished and it being on different joints, we can't bury this one yet, but it, sure. it's certainly on a death march. And it begs the question of why is it getting utilized if we if we're going to go the route that we only have four published and three unpublished, why are we utilizing it as a clinical intervention in the first place when we don't have enough supportive research yet? Jason, anything to add on that stuff? What about cortisone? How about what if well, I just want my pain to go away? Just stick a needle in there. <laughs> oh, shit. Um, well, on, on PRP real quick. Um, I mean, you have to look at the intent of what you're trying to change, right? So in tendinopathy, there's already an increase in the number of tenocytes within that degenerative tendon. It's not that there's a lack of cells. That's not the problem. Like those cells just aren't capable of getting the message of the load and driving adaptations because it's too disorganized to even, as, as Derek said earlier, they're mechanically silent. So you're throwing more cells in an area that's already hypercellular for what end, right? There's no real benefit there. I think we have to also talk about like um, the presentation of these interventions is quite theatrical. Like I'm coming into you as the doctor to the patient. I'm bringing in this needle. The PRP gets spun as like your own cells. Same thing with stem cell. And we're going to take this needle and inject it into the area. Like there's a lot of theatrics. There's a lot of buildup of this should make your pain go away, which is usually what these two interventions are targeted at doing uh, typically. And I think, sure, okay. That may make your pain go away, but are we, like Jason was alluding to, actually making any beneficial tendon changes? And I don't think there's any supportive research for that. So even with PRP, there's a lot of trials. Uh, I think stem cell, it may be on its death march. PRP may be closer to the actual gallows itself. Um, and that we do have a lot of evidence saying that PRP does not enhance tendinopathic changes. And, and some of this, it even gets into a conversation on if you look at PRP trials, a lot of your setup is completely different. And it's hard to say, hey, PRP works, especially when everyone thinks their version of PRP and how they actually prepare the platelet-rich plasma. But every systematic review we have is 
at least neutral, if not leaning towards negative. So the one from 2015 from Hamilton, it's they actually titled platelet-rich plasma does not enhance return to play in hamstrings injury, a randomized controlled trial. So there's there's relatively strong evidence that PRP does not offer anything to the situation when it comes to tendon injuries. What about corticosteroid? Is there any downside splashing that stuff up in the tendon? Jason, you want to take this one? Uh, no, you guys got it. <laughs> uh, so once again, we're talking about corticosteroid as having an anti-inflammatory effect. And I think we've discussed already that there's not a whole lot of inflammatory process in the tendon itself. So we're already kind of at a biological plausibility crossroads there. And then we know that repeated corticosteroid injections can have some degradatory effects on tendons. So there doesn't seem to be a lot of evidence in favor of using corticosteroids. Uh, I think all of your injectables have, have not really shown a ton of efficacy or if nothing else, they actually lack a lot of efficacy for their use. But the problem is this gets back to a prior conversation of athletes and all of us, uh, you know, wanting a quick fix in things. So these are all presented as quick fix interventions where everything we know about tendons or basically getting better at most things in life, it, it's accepting it as time, accepting it as a process along the way. And it's, it's easy to use the trope of, oh, if we decrease your pain, you can tolerate it more, but there isn't any real good evidence that says any one of these decreases pain along the way. So especially when we all meet at the same point down the road. So it really is an addition by subtraction. We want a less is more side of it to where we can say, hey, this works. This is what we want to do. And everything else you can argue is, you know, icing on the cake tools in a toolbox or whatever. But you need to show efficacy before you can say we're going to put the icing on there. And for stem cell, platelet-rich plasma, and corticosteroids, that efficacy is sorely lacking. Mic drop again. <laughs> You're going to run out of mics, man. Uh, anything else you guys want to add? I think uh, you know we'll, we'll talk here for several hours if this thing, if we could. So it's been an hour and a half. Did we ever specifically say the intensity um, they recommended in the bone paper? Uh, it's greater than 70%, right? I, but I don't, I don't I, know that I we specifically said have, that. It's written in front of my face, and I may have read it. It, it, but it is 70, but I, I just don't know if we said it. I don't either. So. I know we. I think we said higher magnitude, but I don't think we said like specifically. Derek did mention percent of 1RM, but I think that was as far as we went with it. Well, Jason, I'll let you officially say it. Go for it. <laughs> Um, so when it comes to tendon loading, probably one of the most important factors is going to be the intensity of the stimulus. So in the bone paper, they talk about needing 70% of one rep max. I don't know if it's that you know hard and fast of a rule that there's is that delineated, but you do need a relatively high intensity, and there's different reasons that may be. Um, one of the common speculations is that you need a, a, a little bit more high intensity stimulus to be able to um, take all the crimp out of the tendon collagen itself and then put enough strain through it to drive adaptations. But that's going to be kind of one of the most important things is not necessarily um, like in the Alfredson protocol, doing that high frequency, high volume training, but making sure you're accounting for how heavy it is to drive that adaptation in the tendon. Awesome. Anybody? So essentially, I was impressed. It, yeah, essentially, it boils down to to close. It, it really is a mix of volume, intensity, and rest. But it's not only within session and what we're doing for our athlete, but being able to step back and take a look at their volume, intensity, and rest on the global scheme of what their training paradigm is. And then, you know, as Mike would concede, a lot of it is just getting their head straight as you get into it as well. Sounds yeah, like there'd absolutely. be a lot of trial and error during that process. <laughs> no, maybe not. So to that point, you want to establish some type of structured program, but you want to give them some type of way to auto-regulate it. So there's some flexibility within structure. Yeah. Is auto for you auto-regulation just being pain monitoring or are you doing some RPEs within the actual intensity 
training as well. So if you were gonna, so if somebody doesn't necessarily know that one rep max is like, I don't know what the fuck my you know Achilles heel raise one rep max is. Jason, we got it, guys. We got it. <laughs> that was a successful podcast right there. <laughs> but but you can always use like an RIR, like Eric Helms has talked about, the repetitions in reserve to get closer to an objective marker of your intensity. So I'll use that with my patients who are a little bit more literate in terms of their strength and conditioning. And tell them, make sure you at least get to the point where you can only do two or three lep, reps remaining. And that's how I'll let them kind of auto-regulate the total volume and intensity. But I'm going to load it heavy enough that that falls within their, you know, 12 to 15 rep max at highest. Does that make sense? Yeah. All so, I got lost was in the word fuck. So I, but yeah. <laughs> so I come at it with a slightly different approach than Jason does in I use RPE instead of reps and reserve, and I tell all of my athletes I want to live in about a 7 or 8 out of 10 for whatever weight we're going to use. And some of this even gets into telling them, because you know if you're going to do leg press or even calf raises from machine to machine, 100 pounds isn't 100 pounds or 400 pounds isn't 400 pounds on every machine. So it gives them a much more arbitrary way of looking at it. So Jason and I are still using a metric of intensity it's just, I won't rate perceived exertion. He may use reps and reserve. So this gets into, you know, there is some leeway in how you're going to frame it to your patients, but we're still quantifying the same metric in the end. Yeah, I would say um, it's, I like RPE a lot for people who have an understanding of how to apply RPE, which are athletes who have been an athlete for a long period of time. But if it's a newer athlete who just had an acute increase in volume or intensity and had this reactive issue, they may not really understand what an 8 out of 10 is or a 9 out of 10 or a 10 out of 10. So I like reps in reserve because then they can understand with like, there's no fucking way I could have done one more rep of that. I, I just find RP is a little bit difficult for newer athletes at times. I, okay. And one thing that's just in my head, it's a question I get a ton. Of, this is the last one I got for you guys. I work with a lot of barbell sport athletes, as I know you guys do as well. They are doing heavy resistance training every day. That's the thing that they're doing. And what we're saying is that heavy resistance training is also the fix. So why are these people coming in with pain? It's like if, I, if I'm going to prescribe, all right, we'll go to the Consgard article and um, you know, do back squats for our intervention, they're already doing back squats. What's the difference? Devils in the dosage. Like clearly they're doing too much that they're not adapting to over broad time. And I really think some of this gets into what we talked about earlier with some of the isometric side of it. And especially like my anterior knee pain with my squatters, a, a lot of times part of the warm up will be something like a, a pause squat and, and trying to get everything tuned up before they actually go into their dosage. So it, it may just be that we need to work a little bit of an additional angle because you think about why we used isometrics in the original study populations it was to get in season athletes the ability to train through well depending on where we are i think a lot of barbell athletes would argue they're always in some form of season if they have a competition coming up and, and this is just a way that we can mitigate those symptoms and allow them to train with it and i would just add that you know I absolutely agree with what Mike and Derek said. Now that, that was great. The dosage makes the poison, and then in terms of changing that stress, but you also kind of want to look at compound versus isolation in this type of instance because there's a lot of way athletes can not necessarily consciously do this, but the body can shield itself from sparing uh, from uh, distributing that stress to those tissues. So you want to throw in some sort of isolation exercise too to get deliberate load on that tendon. Now, is that potentially where isometrics bring benefit? I mean, I guess well, you could do it, that with it, anything. It, it depends on the modality you're using. If you're using a squat, they can still shield away from that patellar tendon, right? So you're going to want to use something that they have no way around it, so like a leg extension. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Cool. Anything else, guys? We did it. Did we cure the world of, of tendinopathy? I wish. Something like that. Okay. Load and intensity and rest. Oh, my. Well, I, you know, I see this, obviously, this topic kind of being rehashed many times over the course of this podcast. Maybe we can have Jason on again, which makes me ask, Jason, besides those two blog articles that I mentioned in the beginning, where can people find you to get more of your stuff, more of your writings, more of your thoughts? Um, yeah, so I'm active on all pretty much social media platforms platforms uh except for instagram don't friend me on there i've literally never posted <laughs> uh 
But so I'm ready to engage with anybody that reaches out to me. I don't necessarily put a lot of original content out. I write a little bit for the physiological PT site. My buddy Kenny Veneer runs. It's mostly kind of philosophy behind treatment and science, which I obviously value a lot and I feel like adds a lot to the field, but not everybody loves. It's not a sexy topic, but you can always find me on there too. Cool. And I recently heard you on the Healthy, Wealthy, and Smart podcast talk about that very thing is how we kind of shape narratives and, and um, help the patient, you know, reform their expectations and beliefs in, into a positive way. And uh, so that stuff is, is fantastic. And, and everybody should check that stuff out. And Jason's been a valuable contributor to the Clinical Athlete Forum, as have Derek and Mike. So thank you, guys. Thank you to all three of you guys. And uh, anything? Oh, Jason is going to do a webinar for us on tendinopathy. And it's, it will just be, a, you know, obviously an hour long or just a more direct version of, of the discussion here and we'll go over I'm sure he'll cover a lot of the stuff that we talked about in, in some capacity but he's going to do a clinical athlete webinar that'll come up in the next uh, who knows uh, eight weeks four six eight weeks something like that we'll pick a date and uh, so be looking out for that on the clinical athlete social media which you should be following anyway uh, anything else guys to close on I really appreciate being here. Thanks, Glenn. Yeah, thanks, yeah, thanks coming, Jason. Man. Okay, another episode in the books. We made yeah. it to three. Uh, we will talk to you guys soon. Mm-hmm.